So, so to be able to be videotaped, should I move like no, here? No, it's fine. It's so anywhere. I mean you can uh, basically the video is like captured in this slide. Oh, this slide. Yeah, and you. So it's like ah, this it's way. Me. Okay. Yeah, you can move around. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Welcome everyone to this week's uh, vegan colloquium. Today we have uh, Professor Erica. June mm -hmm. from uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. She's a mechanical engineer. Uh, she got a bachelor's uh, from University uh, uh, Kaist, right? Yeah, in, yeah. in Korea. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then she got her PhD at Cornell University. And then she did her postdocs at MIT Media Lab. So research is basically involving around uh, modeling these small microorganisms, mm -hmm. right? At uh, uh, MIT, uh, she uh, developed these novel techniques involving how you use this uh, fluorescent, mm -hmm. right? Fluorescent. Yeah, yeah. fluorescent uh, uh, technique. So I'm not really familiar with this thing, so, but it lets you see uh, your, uh, this brain activity, right, when this, uh, neurons firing, you'll be able to see that. So I'm not going to spoil all the fun. So uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, research at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, she has her own lab, a bi uh, bio micro yeah, uh, systems lab. lab. So we actually use a lot of uh, uh, biological systems to see how this neural activity can help uh, shape the understanding of the uh, human brain eventually. And mm -hmm. then use these ideas in temporary body. So I'm really excited about this, and I hope you are too. But without further ado, let's uh, see what uh, Professor Jung has to say about her latest research. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the great introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, so um, my name is Erica Jung. I'm an assistant professor at University of Illinois at Chicago. And I'm in mechanical and engin uh, industrial engineering department. So today I would like to talk about high-speed single-cell resolution neural imaging and an optical uh, brain-machine interface. So I heard that you are mostly like um, a computer scientist and have a background in like um, computational com computer science. So I would uh, start off by uh, making an analog to the your computer circuit to our brain because um, basically the old the research goal for me is to understand the brain human brain or the animal brain so um, to understand how your your circuit electrical circuit works then you need tool to understand what is happening inside and that's basically the readout tool if you um, uh, bring your uh, probe electrical probe close to your uh, electrical circuit then you will see how it's receiving some electrical signal. For brain, this kind of readout tool will read out the neural activity. 
Also, if you want to know how the circuits are connected and how they work together, you want to stimulate certain part of it, and then you want to you see how the signal is propagated um, along the electrical circuit. So that's a stimulation tool. And for to understand the brain, we need that kind of stimulation tool to specifically like interrogate individual neuron and see how the time downstream neuron um, uh, corresponding um, accordingly. So and finally, we want to see how it's uh, in total uh, connected. So that's seeing the entire circuit, the connection, and for brain, we want to know like how the neuronal circuits are uh, connected inside the brain. So those are tools to understand our brain as well as like electrical circuit. And today I would like to focus mostly about um, readout tool and that readout signal will be used to um, actuate some of the devices. So today's talk is going to be um, about first, first part of the today's talk is going to be the readout tool that I developed for the optical imaging to monitor neural activity. So I'll talk about some of the background and how I developed that. It's a biological sensor, so I'll discuss about that. And then I will um, show how it works when it's really um, working in a living brain like animals. And using that um, technique, I will introduce my um, work in my current lab. So this is mostly my postdoc work and this is my uh, work in uh, current lab. So to begin with, I would like to introduce how the, um, like very, very briefly, how the human brain works. So human brain consists of like billions of tens of billions of neurons. And this individual neuron create the electrical signal, like an electrical circuit. And it translate um, its own signal to the next uh, neuron next to, or it connected through the synapses. And uh, if you look at the membrane voltage change, so that electrical signal is translated by the changing in the membrane voltage, it's at the surface membrane change uh, over time. And to know how, what is that signal look like, the intuitively we can bring in some of the electrical probe to the neuron. And there has been um, some tools, that, the great tools for biologists to understand how neuron works using like electronic devices. So one of the uh, traditional device uh, is called the patch clamp, and the other is um, intuitively we can think of the micro uh, electrode array. So let me first talk about the patch clamp because it is a um, very great tool to understand individual cell, single cell, uh, at a single cell level. So if you bring in this kind of glass pipette that uh, has some electrode inside, you can uh, bring it very close to the single uh, neuron membrane, surface of the single neuron membrane, and by detecting how much of the uh, voltage change is going there, you can detect the individual cell, the um, neural activity of individual cell that's basically electrical signal. So it gives a great um, precision, like even a single cell, like even single ion channel level. But to make this uh, recording happen, you need um, this like a complicated set, basically because you have to bring into the size of the single neuron, which is five to 10 micrometer, so which is super small, and you have to wiggle this tip around like to be able to get a good spot to hold the surface of it. So you need a very precise setting and um, this um, ceiling has to be very tight to like holding the surface of the neuron. And even if you want to, even if you want to record from multiple cell, which is critical to understand the neural circuit functional function in, um, in um, ensemble or the network um, scale, then you have to bring in like even at least even for the eight um, recording from a cell simultaneously you have to bring like this much of uh, chunk like bringing together and everything has to be very precise so that's what I said here it's not scalable and uh, that meaning that we cannot uh, record from multiple cells simultaneously which is critical to understand neural circuit because not a single neuron generate um, meaningful um, behavior, but it's all the, um, working together, um, tens of hundreds of neurons working together, or thousands of neurons working together to generate some meaningful behavior. So this is not a good um, method to understand like at a um, 
um, larger level, uh, the higher level, although it is a good tool, good tool to understand how the individual neuron works. So on the other hand, there is a microelectrode array that uh, you can um, integrate tens of or hundreds of uh, pins um, that is more scalable because now you can just increase the number of pins and um, having number of pins you can record from um, the, the neuron signal from the area where it's, it's surrounding the pin. So it's definitely scale more scalable but because it received the signal from all around of neuron, it doesn't have um, single cell neuron uh, resolution. It just gets uh, all the mixture of uh, neural signal that's nearby. That can be where the, some neurons are spiking and some neurons are not. So there is some signal process, um, the difficulty on the signal process. And also uh, because it has to physically go into your brain, so it is. Uh, invasive. I mean, this process, uh, this um, patch clamp is also invasive, and in that um, for the large scale recording, if you want to record from uh, some region of brain, you have to implement that uh, microelectrode, then and that can destroy uh, part of the circuit. So it is invasive. So because this kind of electrical devices has to bring the um, the physical probe. Uh, literally to close to physically close to the individual cell or the region, so they are highly invasive and um, not um, um, advised to use from the, um, the, um, the from reading from the multiple cells, for example, for the uh, patch clamp. So um, biologists uh, came up with this idea, developing some of the um, biological tool, which is called optical sensor, which is a protein. Uh, not a real like a probe or the physical device, but tweak our DNA or tweak uh, DNA of mouse, for example, so it becomes a genetically modified mouse that glow in uh, green on their light uh, because it uh, genetically expressed now this uh, special pro protein, the um, green fluorescent protein. So with this um, fluorescent protein, if we modify this this neuron, which doesn't have any color before, but with this modified gene, now it can glow, it can blink, blink, while it's generating the electrical signal that's converted to an uh, optical signal. So basically this uh, fluorescent uh, protein convert is a special fluorescent protein, so functional, some functional fluorescent protein that's sensitive to the neural activity, so it converts electrical signal fluorescent protein allow you to do some non-invasive reporting because you don't need to like poke it with uh, electrodes but you can just see it and because um, you can express in an entire brain like for example here it's uh, some region, region of um, um, the brain of uh, mouse and you can see like uh, multiple neurons blinking everywhere instead of you physically bringing in like an individual like a probe to measure uh, electricity from electrical change from individual cells. So it's highly um, scalable. So that is a good tool to understand how neuron actually uh, generated signal. So now I want to talk about um, what has been done in this field because I'm not the first one who does this uh, fluorescent, um, does use this fluorescent protein to measure the uh, neural signal, but there are people who have been um, decades using this uh, fluorescent protein to see the neural activity. And here's some example of neural activity of some, some neuron that um, changed its uh, spiking pattern um, through day and night. So the neuron basically spikes, uh, changes its membrane potential from uh, minus 70 to 30 when it's generating the, the neural signal. So it's basically called action potential. And this action potential has a very um, uh, narrow, like um, um, the, the band bandwidth, like a one, one to two milliseconds. So it's a very fast, um, like a spiking uh, procedure. So to be able to capture like this uh, fast spiking nature, that's even spiking rate goes higher than 200 hertz, then we need some, uh, we need a good fluorescent protein that can catch up that sub millisecond imaging to resolve like individual single spike. And the previous, what people have been using previously is detecting the calcium signal. So instead of detecting the electrical signal, 
neuron, when neuron spikes, it um, um, opens up its ion channel and bringing the calcium into the neuron. So it changes the calcium intensity, cal calcium concentration inside a cell, like a neuron itself. And uh, so people have measured like a calcium um, diffusion, calcium concentration instead of the electrical signal and converted that calcium uh, concentration signal to the optical signal. So that's how people translated the neural signal to the, some of the optical signal. And this, is, this has been uh, widely used in um, neuroscience area to understand how neuron works. But uh, this kind of calcium sensor, because measured at uh, diffusion of calcium, so it's too slow to capture like a real um, the electrical activity. Which, for example, here, like a G-CAM sensor is one of the famous uh, sensor uh, used in the neuroscience field. And but it, if we zoom in like this part, um, there has uh, it's supposed to have like this bottom part is a real electrical signal from the individual neuron, and we're supposed to see four spikes in um, 500 milliseconds. But here, if we look it through the calcium sensor, then it is difficult to distinguish individual. Uh, the um, pick. So what I did as a postdoc at a media lab is to develop the sensor that directly detect voltage instead of calcium. So we call it a um, voltage sensor and it is still a biological uh, protein that's um, supposed to, we tweak the DNA and make the, the neuron um, inherently like a pre, the, um, express this uh, cell itself, this express this protein itself. So Having this voltage sensor, uh, we could catch up, for example, it, this is the real uh, electrical signal. And looking through this voltage signal, we can um, see that clearly see that it's corresponding to the exact the neural signal. So uh, over five milliseconds at the same time course. So this was um, um, the biological tool that I developed with my colleague who is also a biologist. And Actually, I'm not a biologist, I'm a mechanical engineer, so we uh, work together to develop this uh, protein sensor. And I'll um, discuss about how we developed it. But the um, point of uh, developing that is to um, have a much faster response time so we don't have any delay of the signal. And also um, want to be able to capture the neural uh, imaging with a single cell resolution. So uh, compared to the what previously have been used in the field, we are able to resolve like individual cell, which individual spike, which is very important to have a, a precise recording. I'm just curious why the graphs are so different. The one is mostly not <coughs> activated, but right, right. Uh, this was like a spontaneous. They used the. We could. I, I could bring up some other uh, spontaneous response activity. This one was just observing some spontaneous activity that uh, happened to be in uh, 500 milliseconds. And we also did, and this was for the characterization to see that how it goes, but it, there is also the signal that we um, observed in a spontaneous response and that also works in the same way. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. So what we want to do with both, what we wanted to do with the voltage sensor is to uh, see if we can observe the neural activity in a real animal, like an intact animal, not taking out the brain out of the animal, but we want to observe as it is. So that's the beauty of like in, vi in vivo imaging. So uh, let me briefly talk about like um, how we, um, what kind of model organisms are used in neuroscience. So uh, many scientists still working on C. elegans and uh, Drosophila, the fruit fly, is also a good, um, good animal model and zebra fish larva is a good animal model. So uh, let me see why people are still working on C. elegans even it has uh, only 300 neurons. And that is the only like animal, if we can call it animal, so that is the only animal yeah, that known to be that, that scientists know the complete connectome at least for this 300. But still, there are lots of like uh, uh, functional connectomics has to be proven for the C. elegans. So people still are working on um, using the C. elegans. And Drosophila provide a good um, uh, animal model, especially to understand like a vision, like its vision system is very close to humans. So people still use like Drosophila to understand um, vision system and also sleep. Zebra fish larva, it is a vertebrate, so it's close to like a mouse and human. And 
uh, especially it has a transparent uh, brain, so we can just see through it, which is a huge advantage for the optical um, recording. And it also developed the um, central nerve system very fast. Mouse, of course, is the most popular animal model used in lab. And um, even like people um, dissect the brain to see, like even the dissected brain still functional, so they can see the neural activity from the sliced brain, or they um, completely dissolve it and plate it on a petri dish, and they still uh, functional. So that's how people still use this to understand. So because it is so difficult to understand as it is, so they are approaching from uh, bottom to top, like from the 300 or like from the slice of the brain. Because it is super uh, difficult like to understand like that many of brain at the same time. So we wanted to help the scientists with our voltage sensor, that's the optical sensor, to make this, convert this electrical signal to the optical signal and um, be able to understand like what's going on inside just looking at it. So before going into how it works in uh, real brain, like uh, in animal brain, I want to um, briefly discuss about how we develop this protein. So, because you are not a biologist, so I just briefly, may, uh, briefly so put things so super simple. So, thinking about like a natural selection, and if you um, have like a very tall, uh, tall tree, and then only the one that can reach to that tall tree can survive. So, for we do the same thing, so we make a lots of mutant, like a millions of mutant of the protein that's previously used and select the best one, brightest one, for example, if that's what we are looking for. Then we select only the best one and then we mutagenesis that, that the best one again, so next generation uh, gets um, brighter and brighter and brighter. So we only select the only brightest one. So we do that uh, multiple rounds. Uh, making millions of mutant and select one out of out of million and uh, diversify. So that kind of after that kind of process, we um, tested that in um, all our animal models and we select the best one. So that's how we do this protein engineering. And basically, that's done in a cell cell scale. So we express the millions of cell and then pick the best one and then go to the next round. So we do this cycle. So although it, it put simple, but it took uh, like um, two years like uh, to this process. And also, I applied some of the mechanical engineering like um, uh, knowledge, like a picking, uh, developing the picking up tool and be able to, uh, making the high throughput screening uh, process. So uh, making the library is like a, we make a random library. So what's the core about this process is be able to pick up like the best one. So that's where the engineering um, process comes in, but it was it should be also do, done in a high throughput because we have millions of uh, libraries. <coughs> okay, so we picked the best one out of millions, and we tested that in um, animals, and so that's where we published uh, this paper about the voltage sensor. I call we we named it Arcon, and. Um, so we tested it in a culture neuron, which is spread it out in a dish, and we tested it in a mouse brain, and we also tested it in all the animal. So first, all the neuroscientists, when they do a test or when they do uh, some research, they often use the culture neuron instead of going into brain because um, in a brain, it's all densely packed and uh, the um, connection is all 3D. So although, I mean, this doesn't represent, the one spread it out on a culture doesn't represent, but you can easily access the, the character, you can easily access the physiological property on a plate. And definitely we don't stop there, we do further do in animal, but we start from here, like, to see how this, uh, um, the, the protein works. So we first express our protein in this neuron. So here is the soma and here is the dendrite. And we detect like a, the regions of interest and see if we can detect the neural signal from there. Because it's a super small scale, like here it's a one micron thickness is one or um, that micron scale. It's a very, very tiny. So definitely no other physical tool can investigate uh, this regional uh, activity from that small uh, area. And even dendritic spine, 
that's a small uh, dot that makes the connection synapses to the other neuron. And that's a, like a nanometer, uh, tens of or hundred nanometer scale. Definitely no other physical tool can go in there to measure the electrical signal from there. So optical signal gives a great opportunity to understand like a small um, length scale. So for example, if this neuron was spiking, spiking, then we were measuring like this much, then you can uh, get the signal from that, that small area. We tested uh, it also, tested our protein. We expressed, mm, expressing means that I made it color. So we uh, colored it with a green fluorescent and uh, in a C. elegans. And um, the C. elegans, now some special uh, neuron that's blinking, we can see using like, um, it is not a blink. Yeah, so you, you see that it's turned on and off uh, using this voltage sensor. So without this voltage sensor, it's, you, it's just black. Because it's just neuron, it doesn't express any color. But with this special, um, actually it's not under review, but it's a um, special color you can see now if under the microscope. And zebrafish, my favorite uh, animal model, and I'll talk more about how we are gonna use this zebrafish for the, f to make a brain machine interface. But zebrafish has a transparent um, brain, and you can see individual neurons along the spinal cord. And zebrafish is special because it, uh, it is a vertebrate, and at the same time, it has a transparent uh, brain. So it is the only, maybe, the animal who, that has a transparent brain as a vertebrate. And we can see so through all the entire um, neural circuit. So here, you can closely uh, zoom in, then you can see like individual neuron, the motor neuron, it's basically along the spinal cord. So this individual motor neuron controls the, the send the signal and the make it um, swim. Okay, so um, we expressed this voltage sensor in a zebrafish and we were able to detect from like a single neuron inside a zebrafish, which would be like five micron scale and we're able to get the neural signal from it. If we use the, um, the electrode to measure the electrical signal from this single neuron, it would be super difficult because first of all, it's difficult to approach to that neuron, not destroying it, but just tapping it, the electrical signal is super difficult. And also getting that, um, the spatial resolution is also very difficult. So we could even separate the signal from the soma and the axon where it sends the signal through. And this is also one micron scale, so it's not otherwise possible. So basically, this is how we uh, looked into while it's, just, it's alive there. And um, you can see it's, um, we, that's why we literally see under the microscope that the neuron is blinking, blinking. And after that, it, it was blinking a lot. So if we show some, something, then it would make a, that crazy signal. So that's um, what I have done um, during my postdoc. <coughs> so basically, I developed the optical tool that convert the optical signal to the elect. Uh, sorry, that convert the electrical signal of the neuron to the optical signal to be able to observe it like uh, in a large scale, like multiple neuron at the same time. So that's the key that we are able to observe um, multiple neurons without bringing uh, any physical tool. So. Um, uh, in the next part of my talk, I will talk about uh, the all optical brain machine interface that I uh, will tell you how I can use this optical imaging to actuate some of the devices. So you may um, know of this ambitious guy, uh, Elon Musk, who wanted to link our brain to a computer. And this is not, not sci-fi, actually. I mean, scientists have been working on um, translating neural signal to actuate some of the robot and simple um, the movements, so for example, like some patient with um, a paralytical, uh, with a paralyzed, um, like paralyzed patient with uh, some impaired brain, if um, we, uh, I, sorry, if we identify some region that's responsible for the more uh, neural, like uh, motor um, activity, then we can get a signal from that implanted device and send that uh, electrical signal to the, to the machine that will actuate to bring. Um, juice uh, for him, for example. So people have been working on this, like um, uh, for the human, people have been working on either uh, implanting some of the microelectrode that can be a little invasive or using some EEG signal that's 
non-invasive or less invasive, but still like uh, the spatial resolution is very, very low. So that, that's some of the, um, the, the things that people are working on to improve the spatial resolution and the more fine um, the movement. And I was thinking of like, what if we let the animal to um, actuate, the, uh, actuate the machine? And for me, especially like I like the zebra fish, uh, and I would like to let the zebra fish control a robot. So that's not just for fun to see if zebra fish can uh, actuate some robot, <laughs> but there are, there are some advantage if we let the zebra fish control some outer device. Because this zebra fish, as I said, it has a transparent brain, so we can have single cell resolution which is not possible in other any, um, even in mouse, with, uh, people still embed the electrical electrode and that gets a signal from multiple, multiple neurons. So uh, unless, zero, if it's not a zero fish, it's diffi difficult to get a, like a single cell resolution uh, signal, and which can be useful to understand basic um, science behind the neural control. And this would make an all optical brain machine interface Otherwise, it has to implant some, some electrode, and that would be uh, that would be interesting tool to understand how the basic like a neural signaling going on for the uh, brain function to understand from the basic science point of view, and also zebra fish serves as a great animal model to study brain disorder. So there is a uh, zebra fish model with the Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and even we can add some drug to zebra fish and to see how it changes its behavior. So it would be a, be a good um, model if we can let the zebra fish um, actuate some external uh, device and if we give some condition, for example, we give some cocaine or we give some alcohol and the zebra fish would do crazy thing. So, and if we can um, test some, some of the potential drug that can cure those conditions, clear up those conditions, then we'll see it behave in a, uh, in a right way. At a, we can observe it at a single cell resolution. So this, if we can let the zebra fish move around the, the machine, then we can do multiple things. Even because it's the best swimmer, so it can uh, actuate the, maybe the best, do the best job to do the robot control underwater. Okay, so that was the idea. So that's what I'm working in my current lab. So I just launched my lab last year at UIC. Where I'm working on is first, I would like to uh, record the neural signal from the zebra fish while showing some visual stimuli and then analyze the neural signal from the individual neuron. So these are signal from the individual neuron and we uh, run the machine learning system, machine learning algorithm to sort out uh, what it was uh, what, you, what this combination of neuron would do if it wanted to move to the left side or if it wanted to move to the right side or if it wanted to move fast. Because those signals are still like um, not known how this ensembles of neuron is still uh, working. So um, the um, hope the machine learning program can um, sort out this unveiled uh, data. And then we convert that um, neural signal to the electrical signal to actuate the device and the device will have a sensor or the camera that will send back the visual stimuli to the zebra fish. So this is kind of the closed loop control that let the zebra fish control the system as well as it um, get adapted or can have a learning experience. So it's an all optical brain machine interface. And just going details into individual part, what I'm doing, so before we uh, actuate like a real robot to record the real uh, scene, we are trying with the, some virtual reality system. So let the zebra fish explore the, the virtual reality system to uh, optimize all other factors that, like how to uh, record this neural signal and how to analyze the neural signal. So we are doing some visual projection of the virtual reality system to the zebra fish. And this is kind of um, very um, um, the initial setting that I'm working on, but it needs also high speed uh, recording because the, the Motor um, navigation takes, requires very high speed uh, recording. So second part that um, I'm also working with my student is to decode this neural signal. So once we record some of the signals, so we need to understand how these neural signals were, were working together to make uh, actual movement. And that will need some machine learning algorithm to sort out or decode this neural signal. And we will use that, uh, that as a reference to um, analyze the input later on when we are showing like a real environmental scene, then we will be able to interpret what zebrafish really wanted to do based on the 
the, um, what we are doing with the virtual reality because we know that how it was actually this. So we convert the neural signal to the electrical signal. And then the last part will be once it's all set it up, then we'll send it to the some of the simple robots. I'm not a robotic person, so I would just adapt even like a Roomba or any the, the cleaning machine, just let it uh, move around. And then uh, the, um, the, um, the robot, real robot will send the, for example, if it had a camera or some IR sensor, then that will send back the image to the ZebraFish. So it makes the real time closed loop uh, control that's controlled by the ZebraFish. And as I said, I don't do it for fun, but there are a lot of interesting applications. So one of the applications would be for the scientists would be uh, taking this, this uh, platform to understand uh, how the neural signaling is doing there, like to, for the normal brain, if it was just normal zero fish, and uh, we understand, um, we'll have to understand like fundamental brain function uh, for the like learning or memory or adaptation or some, uh, some motor control. So it'd be a good tool to understand the basic science as well as zero fish can be used as an animal model for the pathological uh, brains, like uh, some of the, um, the, um, the brain diseases or the, um, some conditions. So we can even use this as uh, some screening tool to, to develop some drug or um, therapeutic, like um, yeah, once we have, uh, for example, if the zero fish has this condition and we, we give some newly developed some, some drug and we see that its motor control improved uh, significantly compared to the previous, so it can be used as a drug screening tool. And ZebraFish serves as a good drug screening tool, supplementing a mouse um, in, a, in a common lab. And also, as an engineering uh, engineer point of view, it suggests a new form of animal machine interface, because so far it was very invasive, like a implement, imp implanting like, um, to the mouse or in a monkey that uh, implements some electrode and then get the signal from um, neuronal neuron around it. But here it gives a single cell resolution and all optical and non-invasive interface. So it would suggest a new form of like um, um, interaction between the animal or the organism, whole organism to the machine. And also it can be used for, um, to control some of the underwater robot because it happens to be the the, the best swimmer, I mean, compared to like other animal model. So in summary, so in my lab, I, um, based on the tool that I developed as a postdoc, uh, which is, which allow us to convert the neural signal to the optical signal, um, I used I used I take advantage of this tool and use that in a in an entire organism and let it uh, control the en uh, environment and um, navigate uh, by itself. Because what people have been previously done with zebra fish is passive, like uh, giving a visual stimuli to the zebra fish just one direction. So you see it and uh, let me know what how you are gonna react. But here with this kind of platform, zebra fish will uh, navigate around by itself. So uh, there is gonna be two way uh, and the closed loop control. So it's gonna suggest a new uh, platform for the scientists to um, take advantage of to understand the basic science and as well as the, the brain disorder condition. So to conclude my um, um, the like uh, my the talk. Uh, I'd like to introduce my background. So I was trained as a mechanical engineer, pure mechanical engineer at Cornell, where I did uh, micro and the nanofluidics. So I'm a fluid dynamic person. But I just um, it was just it happened to be just in um, um synthetic neurobiology lab at MIT Media Lab. So where I learned all this uh, neural uh, activity recording. So I turned my uh, research direction towards the uh, neural uh, activity recording, and where now I am at uh, UIC. I learn um, microbiosystems laboratory at uh, UIC, where I have my PhD student and my master's student. And um, so my theme, my, my goal in my new lab is to develop tools and method to um, help the neuroscientists and the bio biologists to uh, understand um, nature better. So that was part of um, the project that I'm working on and we are also working on other um, areas. And this um, research is supported by the Brain Behavior Research Foundation. 
So yeah, that's the end of my talk, and uh, I, I ran a little faster. So if you have any question, I'm uh, happy to answer. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Yes, I have one. <laughs> Please, go for it. So I, I, I really exciting stuff with the zebrafish, uh -huh. but I'm going to challenge your claim that this is uh, a non-invasive interface for any animal with a skull because mm -hmm. the light doesn't get out. Oh, for the for the mouse or for the human, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for this the non-invasive that that uh, theme can be applied to zebrafish and even for some part of mouse because mouse has a special microscopic that. But for human, it's not um, applicable, I would say. But my theme, is, my my goal is not to translate it to the human, like really let the human, because that's. That's another direction that uh, neuroscientists are doing, like uh, getting some uh, EEG signal and other way. And this is more for the scientific tool to understand because um, this kind of mouse and the zebrafish serves as a good animal model in the lab. So it's more for that, that um, giving a tool instead of really up, uh, applying it to human. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also, like the reason why people are still uh, were using the C. elegans and zebrafish as an animal model is still like we are at the 300 neuron level to understand like and the basic biology consists from like a C. elegans, zebrafish, and the uh, human. So that's why scientists are working on C. elegans just not for fun. But there is uh, some lesson that we that can carry out through the other animal models. So. Um, so zebrafish can uh, give uh, even like a better model than the C. elegans or as a higher organism. So, uh, fundamental biological point of view, it's it's a good model also to understand no, the base bio. With C. Yeah, oh, I sure, sure. That. Sorry, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. You can learn. Right, right, right. So I have a question from mm -hmm. one of the viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, viewers? Yes. So, mm -hmm. Peter. Uh, another faculty mm -hmm. watching this talk right oh, now. Oh, I see. So he asks, uh, why does the zebrafish want to clean up the room? Uh, I think uh, I think he refers <laughs> oh, to the no, no, virtual no, 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 reality. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that that was just one example that I can take any robot because I don't need to make the robotic part fancy, but I can take just any simple robot that can um, navigate itself. But if there is some motivation that for zebrafish to clean out the room, then it can clean out the room, but it can uh, look for the, um, some food or something that uh, happened to be, okay. yeah. Thank you. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's a very cool talk. And yeah. we'd like to thank you. And thank you. another question uh -huh. is that uh, he asked, what type of ML algorithms are they using? Oh, that part I have to investigate further because I'm also like, I'm from like other backgrounds, so I'm, um, reaching out to collaborator who can do find a good uh, machine learning algorithm to that we fit. But I know that many neuroscientists have been already adapting some uh, machine learning program and it's gonna be supervised um, the, um, the algorithm that, cause I will, I will have some reference sets that I can produce just many, many, many data just showing it multiple times. So um, it's not gonna be that complicated like at the beginning because I will um, start from the simple like a motor neuron control but if it gets more complicated uh, understanding like entire brain that's gonna be the whole other uh, story okay. but it's just to kick off like uh, this kind of uh, model okay. mm -hmm. I think there is a question okay. uh, I have a question regarding the tool that you developed so uh -huh. are you considering any kind of noise uh, uh, like while capturing those signals from the brain, so uh, yeah, the with the instrumental <laughs> noise, I can say. Right, right. So the biggest noise that can interrupt there is because it expressed in every neuron. And for example, if it was expressing in every every neuron, then there is a background like a signal that's coming from. So the how we can minimize that is we can genetically target neurons of interest. If we, for example, if we wanted to look at the neuron only responsible for the motor control, then we can specifically express the tool in that neuron only, so we don't need to worry about other non-specific neuron um, exhibiting some, some of the fluorescent signal. I guess my question is also related to the noise. So mm -hmm. uh, you had a slide about uh, that visual stimuli phase right. that I didn't uh, quite understand. Uh -huh. So 
you just show the fish a picture mm -hmm. or yeah you, you can show works? like <coughs> oh, the simplest thing would be you show some strip moving strip so zebra fish will feel that oh fi strip is moving this speed i have to move faster so it take it as a, like a moving environment so simplest would be the strip but i want to build more like a comprehensive like a real scene like a real navigating in the in the under the wa underwater like having sand and some obstacles and uh, once it's implemented to like a um, robot then i would uh, have some maze that can see black and white at the beginning like to for the zebra fish let let it navigate through the its way but as it gets complicated it can be re re real underwater robot that can navigate like a real so mm -hmm. if, if, uh there are human subjects, you can just tell them, okay, just look at those pictures. But how do you make sure that <coughs> the fish is actually looking at the picture and not oh. the environment? Right. I mean, we have like some the, um, um, the, um, the LED or the screen that's big enough for the fish to uh, focus on. But also fish uh, tend to, like it always has to capture, um, always has to detect what's going on. Environment is not to get... Um, attacked by the predator. So if there is some moving object, then it is, is C. But I mean, there is a like, if we, if we set like a, a screen like all around, then there is no other way to see it will see anyways. Mm -hmm. Question. So, so, so we, we have a different type of lab. I'm trying to find out, have you, there's a lot of templates for the zebra fish that everybody's working on. Uh -huh. Have you tried to take their template and reproduce it? This, and since you have a closed loop going, just to see if that behavior that they've worked on and you can re replicate that? Yeah, template, your, your you area. mean like, so what people have mostly working on was like um, the strip, the sending a, sending a moving strip or the, the showing the dot, moving dot. So that, that's an, another thing that I'm, I'm working on that um, building that, that representative scenario, scenery would be uh, one thing that we also have to um, advance because um, it was so simple before, it was usually like a, just sending the strip around the zebra fish moving strip. So it was mostly looking at the speed of the, the, um, the movement. So uh, I want to um, make some scenery that can represent some of the direction or like a, maybe even like emotional, I don't know. But yeah, that would be something that's going to be more realistic, close to what really zebra fish would experience instead of like a very simple scenery. But yeah, I mean, to to start off, I'm taking that that that, that stripes first, like uh, to to optimize all the visual system. So how far are you? This is, you just started this lab last yeah, year. Yeah, I just started. So I'm just taking the neural signal from the zebra fish. So I'm just at the very first stage. So after that, I will get some analysis, and then I will implement that to the robot movement, and then um, we'll see how whether it's we can get that so close to data you've got just the data you created you don't have any you're not bringing any, any input data from outside somebody else to work on um no not really because not many people i mean it has been very recent like because uh, the zebra fish the modern neuron um modern neuronal activity it needs to be recorded at a very high speed uh, above the what people has been used be used to use before with the calcium sensor because calcium sensor cannot capture like a uh, below like 100 hertz, for example, at the um, 100 millisecond um, movement, but zebra fish boot is less than 100 millisecond. So only this voltage sensor, so I'm taking the advantage of the um, optical sensor that I developed because it enables the much higher temporal resolution um, neural activity. So um, not much of the, um, the data that I can take uh, from the previous um, the, um, research, but I am generating with my voltage sensor in the zebra fish. So, in your lab, the main focus is capturing the signals from neuron and its application, how, how we um, use this input to robotics. Yeah, yeah, so, so that's f the, uh, the first goal for me is to set up that, that complete the closed loop, uh, that platform, and I would like to add some of the chemical stimuli and give some conditions, so I want to use this device to um, see its uh, potential as a, some tool, but there is a lot of room to expand to like uh, having uh, better robotic control or uh, having more uh, complicated machine learning algorithm to apply. But um, 
it, that's that's just the initial goal. But I can expand to. Oh, so you're going to focus on the second part also. Uh, more more like um, how we can apply this the tool was yeah once okay. once it's made how it's gonna how how useful it's gonna be to understand like uh, neural circuits and to develop some some of the drugs something like that. Because in commercially commercially available softwares, mm -hmm. there is a there are tools available to view this input signal. Mm -hmm. And see how how you actuate things like maybe robotics arm. Or yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, definitely there are many uh, microcontroller or the control that convert the signal. So the the, the individual part is um, maybe I can adapt from. I think I mean adapt or the create myself. It's that's not sufficient, but um, like making the entire loop would be uh, something that uh, can be useful too. Sure. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So you have a you have an animal in this case a zebra fish, yeah. like you want to do like look at the neurons try to figure out which ones like move right move left right so right right and so like but but the animal is also moving left and right mm -hmm. so like a uh, just, what, just what for like simultaneous just um so do you want to keep you like have them kept in place or do they oh move around oh breathing? yeah yeah so zebra fish is fixed here like I mean uh, fixed here it's like a uh, hold it in place so. Okay. Because to get an optical signal, you cannot it, it you cannot let let it move. So that's how the people observe the neural activity under the microscope. So they stay there. So by um, putting some agarose around it. Okay, but not by like cutting the nerves. No, 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 no. Okay. So they are just intact. So after the experiment, we can release it. Okay. So it just hold it there alive, and then after experiment, it can uh, get swim by itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Um, after you give those uh, supervised machine learning algorithms, what information do you extract? Uh, so it's going to be like, because there's going to be hundreds of neurons that's um, in a spinal cord that uh, work together to generate the, um, the movement. So I first have to identify which of the neuron was uh, responsible or most active I where when it's moving left or when it's moving right. So that's first um, set of data that I would like to get. And also the spiking rate of the individual neuron would be different at different um, making when it's making different behavior so that's another set and how this combination uh like works so that's i mean there there i have to see there there's going to be um degrees of uh complexity but those those kind of um variations would be the what i'm looking for mm -hmm. so now that you're letting the fish control the robot <laughs> It's gonna just take control and hurt you with the robot. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> oh, I I don't know. We'll see uh, how powerful or how invasive this zebra fish can be. But yeah, I think f um, yeah, it will be fine. Yeah, it's got, it's so small. So zebra fish is five millimeter. So even you cannot see like bare eye. So it has to be under microscope. So it, and it won't move anywhere. So yeah, but, but it has a power to move around the robot. So yeah, so I'll keep eye on it. <laughs> Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, there is. Sorry, uh, one Eric Nostrom asked, uh, what is the half-life of Arcon protein? Oh, half-life, uh, like, because it, cause it's a fluorescent protein, so we have to put uh, energy to make it excite. So, like, uh, have to make it some, emit some uh, light and it can bleach as t as we put a lot of light to uh, make it excite. And that's also the um, good uh, advantage of this Arcon. It doesn't bleach very quickly. Because previous sensors bleach like quickly within um, like a um, minute or, but the zebra, the, for the Arcon, it could last up to 30 minutes or even longer if we use a lower uh, light. So the um, bleaching speed wasn't not a problem if our recording time is no, within 30 minutes or even in an hour. So. Yeah, so I think you answered the second part of the question, mm -hmm. uh, which he asked, uh, do the levels stay constant in the neuron long enough yeah. to do the imaging? Right, right. That's, okay. a, that's a very reasonable question. And that's if we use the fluorescent protein that everyone uh, worries about, it will bleach out as, as time goes by. And um, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my question is following up the, the idea of restraining them. Mm -hmm. So they're like, a, so they're like, you interpret it moving left, mm -hmm. but they're not moving anywhere, but the right. imagery is moving. Right. Is that enough to pull them into thinking that they're moving? Yeah, yeah, so that's that's also a good um good um the um, the point. So the 
previously what people have done to zero fish to stimulate their uh, brain is just one direction that um, even if zebra fish was thinking something else, it was showing just, okay, the scene is like moving this and this, so it's just one direction that just show. But now zebra fish has ability that um, now, as I think, want to move to the left, now it, the environment moves left to the right. So it's like a visually they can get fooled, but also like they feel like a stream, uh, the flow stream that that's missing there. So like a if you are sitting on your chair, if you see the visual, um, some reality, then your uh, vision is full. But if there is some water, it was like spreading on your face, then you don't feel that. But also the same, th same thing for the zebra fish. So I would make it fancier if I integrate some of the flow that um, can sense the flow as it moves to the left or right. So that, that can be added component. Because in, in virtual reality, mm -hmm. the other people get uh, sick because they don't have any feedback or mm -hmm. movement but if you have like a fan mm -hmm. as simple as a oh, fan right. you can like sometimes buy oh, right. it because they think you like give you some feedback right 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 so that's that's one visual feedback that's uh, in a closed loop as it can move it around as it think uh, so it's it's a one step ahead uh, one step advance from just giving a one uh, one uh, passive like uh, just the input just let it let it just show anything but still, like it's missing like a sensory uh, input, so that can be implemented. But yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I have another one question. Mm -hmm. A lot of questions today. Very good. <laughs> so um, right now you shown us the visual inputs that mm -hmm. it is receiving, but have you tried some other types of uh, sensory inputs like temperature? Gradient? Yeah, yeah, that's that's also can be implemented as. Uh, pointed out like um, zebra fish sense its uh, flow stream or the moving speed by having like uh, some lateral line some hair mm -hmm. so uh, by uh, navigating the water it sends how fast it's moving so that's a important sensory uh, input for the zebra fish and also it detects on temperature okay. so that's kind of different um, the, the sensory input that I can implement okay. yeah but uh, visual input is one of the most important uh, input for the zebra fish because um, as a baby, the, the eye uh, captures like most of the information. It's so big. And as it gets bigger, it can integrate other sensors too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, there is one more question. So uh, at the beginning, you talked about genetically modifying uh -huh. mouse uh, right, right. to understand the neural activity. Um, have you thought about using the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing? Yeah, 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 uh, definitely. Like Right. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's what also biologists use. That's a more like a biological technique how to make it expressed. And um, we reached that point like uh, we um, reached our goal to express it in a zebra fish well. But that that process can be done either through uh, CRISPR, CRIS9, uh, CRISPR Cas9, or some other way. So that's one other solution too. Yeah. Uh, also, mm -hmm. the you said. The C elegans had 302 neurons yeah. as a complete connection. Okay. Does the uh, zebra fish also has? No, no, the zebra fish has a lot, like hundreds of, hundred of tens of uh, neurons. So it's very, it's, um, oh, less than the mouse, but still it has complete, uh, very complex uh, uh, nerve system. So there is no, the, c the uh, connectome is not. No, 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 no. Not even like a uh, fruit fly. Like okay. 300 is already too complicated. It's like, what I meant by the, the connectome is revealed that is structural connectome. And the really functional connectome is if you trigger this and how it's going to connect to the other, when it's functional, that's not still unknown for the 300 level still. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? I think we are also running out of time. Yeah. All right, so then let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. Yeah. Yeah.